Derek Daka. The big picture comes uh, every Tuesday and uh, Thursday at 1930. Uh, right, uh, we talk about uh, issues that are affecting the community and also our political system, Zambia and also uh, Africa at large. Right, uh, tonight uh, on the show we have uh, our guest uh, and uh, that's the president uh, for uh, P uh, PEP PEP and also uh, is uh, the finance chair chairperson for uh, the Alli Alli Alliance for Opposition. Uh, uh, in Zambia, right? Uh, and uh, the topic that we have tonight is about uh, the ongoing uh, national dialogue, right? Uh, and also, we have to let you know that uh, last week we started on a topic, and this is about uh, sexual abuse, right? Uh, in Zambia, and in particular, as in Kitwe, right? Uh, we had uh, the topic going on with uh, Chawanzi Mwanza. The picture is on the background. You can look at the picture of uh, Chawanzi Mwanza, the lady that was raped by her uh, uncle at the age of eight. Uh, right, uh, and also we had uh, great response uh, coming from uh, NGOCC and also different organizations looking at this uh, matter of uh, our friend uh, Chawanzi Mwanza. Right, uh, what is wrong with our country? What is wrong with uh, the society or the community rather? Or is it uh, the political system that is failing, you know, our own people? Or it's, uh, you know, the government, right? Uh, and uh, we have uh, this issue going on of, uh, you know, uh, the dialogue going on uh, and uh, also we are looking at uh, the story of violence in Sesheke. Dixon Jerry poses a question and uh, this will be many of uh, the stories that we'll be discussing with uh, Mr. Sean Temple. Right, we're going on a very short commercial break uh, to welcome our guest on the show. Stay tuned and uh, don't go away. <laughs> I've been trying to reach you, but you could only be left to work. I've been trying to reach you, but you could only be left to work. Oh, oh. Kaya, 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 oko. Yeah, yeah. Kaya, 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 oko. But I pray you still had your Bible. Welcome to the big picture. I'm your host, Derek Daka. So at the moment, Nkani ya manifesto, ni chizungu cha mena chima mveka buino buino, but ni chizungu cha boza. Okay. Put it aside. In our manifesto and good governance, I think we are the best because so far, imagine, we are only three months. We are turning four months. So, that, so is Zambia. And the, that is why when you go to Southern Province, you find the door doesn't get done. Ninjana. Okay. You know, when some people are hungry, they lose integrity. Okay. Government. Yes. So if you have it wrong in the political party, you certainly will have it wrong in government. If the practices are wrong in a political party, you can expect that when you take power, the practices are, are wrong. It is not a PF in Congole per se. It's for Zambia. It's for Zambia. It's for you and I. That's why I was talking about the sovereign <laughs> politicians. The sovereign I think politicians and then that's why I broke it. Self. That's why I broke it. Yes. They switch. Yeah, uh, that's why I broke it down to individuals per capita.
I promise you that uh, we have to clear the air with uh, so many stories that we've been discussing about uh, and our guest uh, is already in the studios. Uh, good evening, Mr. President. Good evening, Derek. How are you? Long time and looking great. Thank you. Thank and you. Also You're looking great. Yourself. Thank you. Thank you. All right, been... uh, welcome to the program. Thank welcome. you so much. Yeah. Right, uh, and uh, also uh, some of our viewers that uh, are just watching you for the first time on live TV, maybe you can uh, give them a brief of uh, maybe your profile. Yes, uh, my name is Sean Tembo. I'm the party president for the Patriots for Economic Progress. Uh, PEP is a, a political party that is duly registered in the Republic of Zambia. We have been operating for the past three years now, and uh, I think we've made a lot of inroads uh, on the Zambian political scene. We have basically set up uh, structures pretty much across the country at provincial level, okay. district level, and right now we are working at the constituency level. Okay. Our hope is that we should be done with the constituency level by mid of this year, okay. and then we'll proceed to uh, work on structures at ward level and section level. Okay. So the hope is that by 2020 or so, we should have structures across the country. And then in terms of our membership, I think it's drawn from pretty much all parts of the country. And uh, we have been involved in a number of activities. I think most people know us by those fire tender protests mm -hmm. where we were going with wheelbarrows uh, along Church Road just to, uh, you know, attract the attention of the citizens to the, you know, corruption involved in the purchase of those yeah. uh, fire tenders. And of late, we decided to join the Opposition Alliance, uh, which is a collective of, uh, we started off as 10 political parties. Mm -hmm. And now we are 13 political parties and still growing. So, yeah, we, we are very happy of our political achievements so far, and uh, we believe that the future is bright. All right. Uh, now, uh, looking at uh, you as um, a party yes. and uh, joining um, an opposition alliance, how do you put it? First of all, are you not disturbing uh, your followers in terms of uh, the party? Not at all. You must understand, uh, Comrade, that... Um, when you look at um, the individual political parties on the Zambia's uh, uh, political landscape, yes. uh, each, each of these parties have certain competences. Uh, some are good at uh, grassroots mobilization, yes. others are good uh, because uh, they existed longer and they have wider structures. Yes. Uh, others uh, are quite arrogant in terms yes. of presenting uh, the case of the opposition. So. Basically, when you come together and you put your various skills on the table and uh, move towards a common objective, which mm -hmm. is to improve the lives of the Zambian people, then you are likely to have more impact than if you operated uh, individually. Mm -hmm. And naturally, if you are operating individually, there is room for uh, inter-party rivalry. Yes. So you, you find yourselves before long that uh, uh, instead of focusing on opposing the, the ruling party, you begin throwing jabs at one another. Yes. And that is uh, uh, a waste of a lot of uh, energy because uh, you'll be bickering among yourselves as yes. opposition instead of uh, being united and presenting a united front uh, for the betterment of the people. Because you must understand that uh, a ruling party will, is, is most likely to deliver to the aspirations of the people if they have constant pressure from the opposition. Yes. And the only way that you can exert that pressure effectively is if you are united and then come 2021 obviously uh, we expect to win the uh, general election okay. with a landslide uh, okay. so that we can basically deliver the kind of zambia that the citizens of this republic have always looked forward to okay yes right uh, mr president now looking at you as a president now you've gone into an alliance with uh, uh, the 10 political parties yes. and uh, there are speculations that were moving over social media and also uh, across Zambia to say uh, you've already chosen your candidate for 2021. And uh, this is uh, Mr. Haga in the Ichilema for the UPND. Well, I must say that um, uh, for, for an undertaking such as this opposition alliance, something that is so significant and something that has a huge bearing on the lives of, of almost each and every Zambian, uh, we, we are bound to have speculations in terms of uh, who is going to stand and how the selection process is going to be. But I can assure you that um, 
as at now we haven't yet addressed the issue of the candidate uh, for 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 2021 um, and and when we do address that issue then uh, we shall you know uh, communicate to the citizens of this republic on a timely basis uh, suffice to mention that um, obviously the UPND is the largest opposition political party so when the time comes to choose a candidate who should lead the alliance into 2021 uh, chances are high that uh, Mr. Ichilema will be selected as that candidate. Yeah, it's, it's only uh, common sense. Okay. <laughs> you <Right>. understand? <laughs> uh, it's not something that, uh, 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 yeah. uh, uh, you know, people should scratch their heads so much about. I think that's, that's pretty much common sense from my standpoint. Of course, I'm not speaking on behalf of the rest of the alliance, yeah. but I'm speaking as Sean Tembo, the party president of PEP. Yeah. Uh, it would only be natural to select a person who is leading the largest opposition. Yeah, so basically that's my, my position. Uh, now, uh, looking at uh, the story that is out in Zambia and also eating everyone, especially on the day, like today, as uh, Sesheke votes, mm. violence, how should the opposition react to such vices, especially in a by-election, but not a general election? Well, you know, I've always asserted the fact that um, a degeneration of political violence is a verdict on the poor leadership of uh, the Republican president, His Excellency Mr. Edgar Jaguarungu, because he is the commander in chief of the armed forces. He is the one that is responsible yeah. uh, and the appointing authority of all law enforcement agencies. Uh, uh, so, so to me, this issue of political violence is uh, something that uh, can be ended overnight yeah. if there was political will from the president. But it appears that um, the president is benefiting from political violence. Uh, uh, him and his party are benefiting from political violence. And that is the only reason why political violence has thrived under uh, uh, President Rungo's leadership. You must remember that um, during, uh, 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 you know, Chiruba's time, uh, there was quite a lot of political violence. Uh, but when, when Levy uh, Manawasa became president, that violence ceased for the period that Levy was president. Yeah, yeah. and uh, when uh, Rupia Banda uh, became president, that political violence came back again. So, so political violence is something that exists out of uh, the wishes of the uh, given Republican president at the time. Okay. And as of now, the reason people are fighting each other is because President Rungu uh, not only tolerates that, but to a large extent, indirectly um, uh, encourages it. Okay. Uh, if the president woke up tomorrow and decided that there isn't going to be political violence in this country, then political violence would end because he would make sure that uh, the law enforcement agencies who are the Zambia Police Service, to a large extent, are enforcing the laws fairly and equitably. That is all that is required. Okay. Enforcing the law firmly, fairly, and equitably. Right. And then you are home and dry. Okay. You, 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 you are going to get rid of political violence. So I've always asserted that uh, every blood of every citizen that is shed out of political violence is on the hands of President Rungu because he's the one that is tolerating this political violence. Right, and now uh, we get now to the issue of today that we have as a topic. It's a finger pointing of uh, the two mother bodies. There's a ZCID and the church. Well, ZCID is not really a mother body. Um, uh, I mean, uh, the organization that is uh, yet to declare themselves ready to move with uh, the dialogue. And mm. right here, there's the church and uh, also the Z Z Z ZCID. Right. What is happening, first of all, Mr. President, between uh, these two uh, teams that are yet to decide when and how they are going to handle the issue? First of all, I must clarify that... Uh, the national dialogue and reconciliation process is already ongoing. Okay. Yes. Uh, it was uh, launched on the 18th of January at the Anglican uh, Cathedral of the Holy Cross. And uh, right now, as political prayers, we are just waiting for the church to advise on the next steps uh, uh, regarding this uh, dialogue process. However, yes. Sorry to cut you short. Mm. Uh, we, we have a clip of uh, President Nawakwi mm. saying that uh, the dialogue that was launched by the church is uh, for the church. So I don't know how now politicians are putting this 
is it a dialogue for a certain grouping of people or it's for everyone? First of all, maybe let me add a bit of context to this yeah. dialogue process. Um, you know, when, when you talk about dialogue, first yeah. of all, maybe the question you might want to have answered is, why do we need dialogue? Okay. Yes, we need dialogue because um, when you look at uh, the 2016 general elections, yeah. those general elections brought about a lot of tension in this country for the simple reason that they were not undertaken on a level playing field. Um, there was a lot of political violence, mostly perpetrated by the ruling Patriotic Front. Uh, the electoral laws that exist, that Electoral Process Act of 2016, basically legalizes electoral malpractice. And then you have uh, the abuse of a public order act by uh, the Patriotic Front and this government through the Zambia Police Service, whereby they are effectively preventing us in the opposition from campaigning from delivering our messages to the people so that they are the only ones who are able to meet the people. If they hear of uh, President Hakainde uh, Ichirema meeting the citizens in Kanyama, the police are quickly deployed. And then he's uh, uh, tear gassed out of Kanyama. Uh, and yet the reason why the PF themselves came to power is because Sata was allowed to campaign freely by both uh, Manawasa and the, uh, Lupia Banda. But they themselves don't want others to campaign freely. So there's this abuse. And when there's such an abusive environment, um, you, 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 you find that people will find it hard to accept whatever the outcome of those elections are. So that's what gave rise to the, uh, to the, to the tension, to the political tension subsequent to the 2016 general elections, which led to the forced arrest of President Hichilema on prison charges. Now, when the Commonwealth came to, to, to help address this matter, the PF and this government are the ones who reached out to the Commonwealth to say, we want you to help reduce political tension through a process of dialogue and reconciliation. It wasn't us in the opposition. Okay. It was the PF themselves. You understand? And then when uh, the, the Commonwealth brought Professor Gambari to start reading this process, the PF you turned and said no. We don't need a foreign body to basically read this uh, process of dialogue and reconciliation. We need a local institution because the country is not in a crisis and uh, we can solve our own problems as a, as a nation. So as opposition, we said, OK, fine. What do you propose? And it is the PF themselves that proposed the church mother bodies and said, no, the church can facilitate and read this dialogue and reconciliation process. Mm -hmm. So we said, OK, fine. That, that's fine with us as opposition. And the church came on board. We agreed in writing, all of us, mm. the opposition, the PF, ZCID, we agreed in Siavonga to say the church will read and chair the process. And then subsequent to that, when the PF saw that uh, the church was making inroads to read and chair the process, they now want to start causing confusion. However, uh, uh, at the moment, they don't want to do it directly, the patriotic front. They want to do it uh, through surrogate individuals and political parties. And that is why they went and woke up, you know, people who were in political slumber, like Edith Nawakwi, you know, like Winter Kavimba, like uh, Sakwewa Skota, like Felix Mutat. I mean, when did you last hear uh, uh, Nawakwi talk anything about uh, Zambian citizens, about the suffering of the citizens, whether the citizens haven't been paid for the mess they've supplied to FRA, or students have been stripped of their meal allowances, have you ever heard uh, uh, Nawakwi open her mouth to, to, to voice her concern? The only time she woke up and said something is when he, uh, she was woken up from slumber, uh, okay. probably at a fee by the Patriotic Front, okay. to come and parlot on behalf of the Patriotic Front. And uh, uh, you were mentioned, so we have a clip, and yes. this clip will be played, uh, uh, Mr. Chiwele, uh, may, may, maybe you can play that clip for us. As political parties, we remain committed to legal reforms which will promote peace and stability in the country. Politicians who are the Secretary Generals of political parties shall revert to their political parties when this process has started. However, the, the Executive Director for ZCID and the other professionals will be the ones interacting with the Secretary Generals that will be the Secretary Generals of the three church mother bodies. It is important here to point out that the end of the meeting, at the end of the meeting on the Memorandum of Understanding, Mr. Charles Mirupi, the Honorable Charles Mirupi, has called. All right, 
it uh, welcome back again uh, that's a clip that we just uh, from playing for you to mm. see and uh, now uh, you hear mm, madam nawakwi they are trying to clarify on the um, the role that the zcid will play in mm. uh, the process so so basically yeah after we all agreed to say the church mother bodies will read the process uh, the church called a meeting on the 28th of December 2018, and we all attended, including FDG themselves. At that meeting, the church uh, stated that the launch of the dialogue process will be on the 5th of January, yes. and uh, we all agreed. And then the patriotic front went back to the church and informed the church to say, no, our president, who is president, would not be in the country on the 5th of January. So can you move this dialogue process launch to a later date? And uh, that is how the church arrived at the date of 18th of January. So it is the PF themselves. And then when that date came, the PF didn't show up at the Cathedral of the Holy Cross uh, to attend that launch. But everybody else was pretty much there, apart from the PF and their four surrogates, who are Winter Kavimba, Edith Nawakwi, Sakwiba Skota, and Felix Mutati. You understand? These are the only people who didn't attend the dialogue launch. And then their excuse, apparently, was that uh, they were not invited. But how can you say you are not invited to a function whose date you yourselves proposed? Because the launch was supposed to be on the 5th. Yeah. That was the date which the church initially set. Now, uh, the PF proposed the 18th. So, so for all intents and purposes, the PF do not want this dialogue process to succeed for a very simple reason. They are afraid of uh, the tools that they are using to stay in power to be taken away from them. And that includes the abuse of the Public Order Act to prevent us in the opposition from campaigning. Uh, if we are able to freely campaign, I can assure you that come 2021, the PF would be very lucky if they were to retain more than 10 parliamentary seats. Because the people are sick and tired of the PF. They were sick and tired of the PF way before uh, the late president actually passed on. They were sick and tired of PF. Uh, the only thing that has been keeping PF in power are those tools of uh, basically abusing the Public Order Act to arrest us. There's no opposition leader, there's no credible opposition leader that has not been arrested for campaigning. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any credible opposition leader has been arrested before for campaigning. Right now, as we speak, Honorable uh, Chimbagamwiri is in court. He appeared today, if I'm not mistaken, for meeting his constituents in his own constituents. He's an MP. So <laughs> that's the level of uh, mediocrity that uh, exists in the government of the day. And they know that once that tool is taken away from them, uh, then they will lose by, you know, uh, a huge margin. But we don't care whether they keep the public order act. As far as we are concerned, as opposition alliance, we are winning the 2021 general election with the landslide. With or without the public order act, with or without media abuse, with or without political violence, we are winning 2021. Yeah. Right, uh, now uh, moving to the same story of uh, the dialogue that we are discussing right now. And uh, some people are putting it uh, to say it's, um, you know, it's being channeled by uh, President Aga in the Ichilema as an individual. And that's the reason why the PF uh, doesn't want to join that process. Well, uh, like I told you earlier, the PF don't want the dialogue to succeed. Okay. <laughs> because we are talking about leveling the playing field. We are saying don't abuse the public order act. So if the dialogue goes to succeed, that too would be taken away from them. So they will do whatever it takes to make sure that the dialogue fails. And uh, that includes uh, coming up with all sorts of excuses, like the one you are just from giving us, uh, as well as hiring uh, any available politician for hire to add to their voice. And I must mention that um, I, I, I have uh, respect for uh, Madam Edith Nawakwe, but my respect for her is not uh, based on her current uh, uh, conduct. No. Uh, because her current conduct is very shameful. My respect for her is based on her prior contribution to this republic. Mm -hmm. When she served under the uh, uh, FTJ administration, and um, I believe she did contribute to some extent uh, towards the, the development of this country. And for that, I respect her for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but of late, she has transformed herself into a politician for hire. Basically, available to be uh, 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 you know, to parrot whatever the PF want her to parrot. And uh, for that, you know, I don't have any respect for her on that basis. Uh, but, but because of what she did in the past, I'll continue respecting her as, uh, you know, one of the uh, political figures of yesteryear. Okay. 
right and now we are going on a very short uh, commercial break uh, just to uh, say thank you to our sponsors and uh, this is no other than uh, vintage services limited we'll be back after this short commercial break enjoy <laughs> Welcome to the big picture. I'm your host, Derek Daka. So at the moment, Nkani ya manifesto, ni chizungu cha mana chima mbeka buino buino, but ni chizungu cha boza. Okay. Put it aside. In our manifesto and good governance, I think we are the best. Because so far, imagine, we are only three months. We are turning four months. So that is that is why when you go to southern province, you know, the road doesn't get done. Ninjana. Okay. You know, when some people are hungry, they lose integrity of okay. government. Yes. So if you have it wrong in the political party, you certainly will have it wrong in government. If the practices are wrong in a political party, you can expect that when you take power, the practices are, are wrong. It is not a PF in Congole per se. It's for Zambia. It's for Zambia. It's for you and I. That's why I was talking about the sovereign right. politicians. politicians, I think politicians and then that's why I broke it. Safe. That's why I broke it. Yes. They switch. Uh, yeah, uh, that's why I broke it down to individuals per capita. I've been trying to reach you, but it only been it work. I've been trying to reach you, but it only been it work. Welcome back uh, on the big picture writer uh, and uh, this one Jerry writer, uh, a lawyer and also uh, a politician. It says uh, the Mfungwe parliamentary by election of uh, April 2010 was uh, one of the bloodiest uh, in recent history of our country. Zambia, the Seshake style houses were taught, uh, touched, and while dozens of people were maimed and all badly injured during the, the fierce between PF and uh, between the ruling U, um, MMD and uh, the opposition UPND supporters, the president uh, uh, called for a, a quick meeting and uh, uh, with uh, the defense and security leadership. This was an acceptable president, Pia Banda fumed at um, at a meeting and the inspector general of uh, police was put on the blame by everyone and by uh, by everyone in attendance they also wondered why he was in Lusaka when uh, the situation was uh, deteriorating in uh, Mufumwe. he told he told uh, he told he was taught to show leadership and uh, as he said so as the meeting got heated, Army Commander General Wisdom Loper took the floor with a few words. He asked the IG one simple question. Have you failed to, to curl the violence in Mufumwe? And the, the, the general asked, uh, stating he wanted yes or no answer. If the answer was yes, the general wanted to send his men to sort out the situation. We can't keep the commander in chief busy discussing small issues like political violence of drunk cadres. He said, uh, "It's um, the IG that was dispatched at the area after they confirmed, and he had the capacity to bring down order. And order prevailed at the moment he arrived. In fact, he had almost a physical fight with UPND leader. And remember that picture went viral." Writer and uh, this is uh, Dixon Jerry that writes uh, to Live TV and also to the country at large. But uh, our question is uh, that uh, um, is the police ready to curb these vices of violence in all these uh, different uh, parts of the country when we have uh, such you know um, activities such as uh, by elections? Writer uh, and our guest for tonight is the president of uh, PEP PEP. And uh, is with us uh, tonight is uh, Mr. Sean Tembo. Welcome back, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Comrade Derek. I think your, what you uh, read there, uh, which uh, Comrade uh, Dixon Jerry uh, uh, wrote and sent to you, re echoes my earlier opening statement, if you remember, yes, yes. where I said um, this political violence is a verdict on the leadership of this country. Yes. It's a verdict specifically on President Rungu. Yes. Because, you know, given all the resources we have in this country, 
There is no way that uh, the police service, if they had the political will, could fail to quell the violence in such a small location as Sesheke. Mm -hmm. The only reason violence thrived in that area is because it is being tolerated mm -hmm. by the presidency, uh, the, by the president himself. And, um, it, it, you know, how, how this violence actually ex escalates is that um, you find um, uh, that the police are working under instructions that, uh, you know, people of uh, uh, the ruling party affiliation, PF cutters, should not be apprehended. Uh, these instructions have always been there. Uh, even in Chiranga, it was the same thing. So if the police are doing patrols and they find PF cutters with pangas, they were instructed not to apprehend them. But if they find the opposition with pangas or any offensive weapons, they were instructed to arrest them. So that inequality, that, that inequitable application of the law, is what infuriates the other group. And at the end of the day, you have a political crash. If the police were allowed to operate fairly and equitably, they will crush that violence, and there won't be violence. And PF cutters and UPND cutters and indeed any other cutters will be able to walk side by side without fighting each other if the police were to operate freely without their hands and legs being tied. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that the police are quite professional. Uh, as an institution, without political in interference, the police is quite professional. Yeah. Uh, the police only appears to be biased. The police only appears to be incompetent because their hands and legs are being tied by political decisions, mm -hmm. by the Minister of Home Affairs, by the PS of Home Affairs, and other political leaders. You understand? Yeah. So, so the only way to quell this issue of political violence is to allow our law enforcement agencies to operate freely, fairly, and equitably. And then political violence will be done. All right. Is there now political will or not? There isn't political will because, uh, you know, like I told you earlier, the PF is a finished political party. Yeah. So they are f trying to, to, to use certain tools to try to cling to power, you know. And uh, one of the tools is to create confusion. Uh, so when you create confusion, the way police were instructed to be firing automatic weapons on the heads of residents like that. So, so that creates fear. In the, in, the, in the hearts of most residents. Mm -hmm. And then they spread, uh, 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 they will spread, they will spread a, a false rumor to say, no, if you go and vote, maybe something will happen to you. So the people will be thinking about that rapid uh, gunfire, that automatic gunfire. Mm -hmm. And they'll be thinking, ah, instead of me dying because of my vote, even if I stay home without voting, then it will be fine. No one will know that I didn't go to vote. You understand? So they try to, to put fear into the people so that uh, the voter turnout is, is, is much lower. And the people who support PF are the ones that uh, will walk confidently to go and cast their vote. So, so it's a political gimmick. But what we've always said is that, um, you know, this tactic which uh, President Rungu is using to use political violence as a political gimmick is a very dangerous thing. Because the thing about violence is that, um, you, you know, you might think you can control it. But there comes a time when it escalates to an extent whereby even you yourself who has created it, uh, becomes unable to actually control it. Mm. And then this country will be engulfed. And what we are saying is that, you know, this Republic of Zambia existed way before President Rungu became president. And it's going to exist way after President Rungu ceases to be president. Mm. So President Rungu should not destroy this country by using political violence as a political tool to basically, you know, uplift the uh, dwindling political fortunes of his uh, ruling patriotic front. That is totally unacceptable. And I wish to challenge the president, if he is uh, sincere about condemning violence, then he shouldn't pay lip service to the fight against political violence. Mm -hmm. He must uh, be decisive. He must be firm. And like uh, uh, that uh, uh, article which you quoted by uh, Comrade uh, Dixon Jerry, yeah. uh, this country cannot fail to quell political violence, whether it is in a by-election or in a general election, if there is political will. If the police, and the police is a huge... Uh, service. Uh, they can uh, every handle that. Yeah. Uh, but even if they failed, we have the military, which can quickly move in and restore law and order. And the reason all those things, excuse me, the reason all those things are not done is because there is no political will. And political will is not at ministerial level, no. Campiongo just does what is instructed. Political will is at the highest level, the level of Republican president. Mm -hmm. So this uh, political violence is a verdict of uh, a failure of leadership by the president of this country. All right, Mr. President. Now, uh, this one has written and asking you to say, you are the president for your own party. 
and how do you look at the economy of Zambia? Because as the youths, we are suffering. And if joining your party, do you assure us to be safe or not? Yeah. Um, you know, when you look at the economy of this country, first of all, this country has a lot of potential, uh, Derek. Um, we have an abundance of, uh, you know, agricultural land. Uh, a lot of countries like Malawi, they have a small piece of agricultural land, but their agricultural exports are about three or four times our exports. Uh, we have an abundance of uh, tourism potential. We have uh, very fantastic lakes. We have one of the seven wonders of the world, the Victoria Falls. Uh, and yet you find that uh, countries which have uh, a fraction of our tourism assets earn 10, 20 times more tourism revenue from their tourism sector, like Kenya, you know, uh, uh, Botswana. Uh, we, we have uh, mining potential and yet we only earn a fraction from our mining resources. So that shows you that um, uh, this country is a blessed country. If God wanted Zambians to suffer, he wouldn't have blessed us with all these natural resources. You understand? The reason that God blessed us with all these natural resources is because he wants this country to be prosperous. He wants the citizens of this country not to be paupers, not to be beggars, but to be uh, uh, prosperous. Okay. You understand? So, so, so the reason we are suffering so much, the reason the levels of poverty are so high, is because of a failure of leadership. Already I'll give you an example. Um, uh, the government recently made a decision to basically cut meal allowances for university students on the basis that they are implementing austerity measures. And yet, just a few months ago, the same government spent quite a lot of money, about uh, close to $60 million, to purchase a private jet, an additional private jet for the president, uh, which translates to about $700 million quarter. So, so between the luxury and comfort of one individual citizen of this republic and the future and education of uh, thousands of uh, uh, our citizens. Yeah. Between these two, surely, uh, should the responsible government have a challenge deciding where the resources should be applied? Because that 700 million that was used to purchase a private jet can actually pay meal allowances for all the eight public universities for 14 years. Okay. You understand? So, so that is the lack of priority we are talking about. Uh, right now, you are talking about peasant farmers who supplied uh, maize to food reserve agency not being paid up to now. And that's almost a year ago now. And yet, the same government, which claims not to have money to pay peasant farmers for the maize that they supplied, which maize was sold to DRC, and they were paid cash, by the way, when they sold the, the maize of the peasant farmers to DRC. They were paid cash. They were paid dollars. But they don't want to get that money and uh, pay to the farmers, the owners of the maize. Uh, instead, they send um, the president's wife on a, on a trip to the U.S. Uh, to go and receive uh, used fire trucks. And she goes with an entourage of 25 people. Mm -hmm. They spent uh, millions of dollars on that trip. Dollars. That money could have been uh, used to pay peasant farmers that had supplied maize to government. I mean, between sending the first lady to the U.S. Uh, for two weeks uh, uh, with an entourage of 25 and pay, to yes, go and test, uh, to go and receive a, a, a donation. If you ask me, that was just a disguise for the first lady to go shopping okay. uh, uh, using taxpayers' money because it doesn't make sense. Why would you want to go with an entourage of 25? And why would you want to go for two weeks uh, using taxpayers' money? And yet there are peasant farmers uh, whom you got maize from, which maize you've already sold, who you haven't paid. I mean, you, you need to be morally bankrupt for you to make such a decision. So, so to a large extent, the current government, the PF government, is for all intents and purposes a morally bankrupt government. Okay. And the moral bankruptcy starts right from the top. You know? and, and they know that they have since lost support of the people, they have lost support of the masses, and the only way they can cling to power is through the use of political violence. Okay. That is one of the few tools that they are now using to try and cling to power so that they can have a semblance of political support even when they have zero support on the ground. Okay. Now, looking at uh, this issue that you stood in, in court and also being allowed to file your, um, your, your, your issue again after some time in court, right? For me, I'll take you back to this issue. You stood for the fire trucks. And why <laughs> are you not uh, protesting again over this issue of... Uh, the donation of fire trucks to Zambia that we see as um, another issue. 
Well, at the moment, as uh, Patriots for Economic Progress, we have two cases that are before court. Okay. Uh, we have one matter that is before the Constitutional Court. Actually, we have a hearing tomorrow morning uh, okay. before the full bench of the Constitutional Court. Uh, that is the matter where we took um, the Republican president, uh, uh, Mr. Lungu, to, to court uh, over the uh, land gift that he received. Okay. I wouldn't want to dwell so much on that matter because uh, it would be subjudice, yes. given that it is actively before court. Other than that matter, we have another matter, which is before the High Court. Uh, that matter is uh, whereby we took the Zambia Police Service, of course, through the Attorney General to court, uh, for them preventing us to undertake uh, our protests. If you remember, we used to do uh, fire tender protests. Uh, we, we, we planned a total of 42 fire tender protests uh, over those fire tenders which the government bought at exaggerated prices of one million apiece. And uh, out of the 42 that we had planned, we undertook about 13 protests. Uh, we used to carry them every fortunately, that is every after one week, or every after two weeks, if you say. Um, so, so on our 13th uh, protest, the police basically uh, stopped us from protesting. We always used to give the usual seven days notice in compliance with Section 5 of the Public Order Act. And the police stopped us uh, giving some funny excuse, saying that we were supposed to get a permit from the council. And uh, I think the issues of um, uh, uh, the application of the Public Order Act is something that uh, is well uh, settled in most courts of law, most notable in that Christine Mundica uh, case, as well as that uh, Less Than Doctors Association case. So what we decided is that uh, we felt that was an abuse by the police, and we took the uh, police to uh, the High Court. Uh, the matter is also active in court. Uh, we are making submissions at the moment, um, uh, and then uh, after each party files their submissions, the matter should be ready for uh, judgment by, 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 the, uh, by the, the judge who is presiding over it. So those are the two matters that we have in court. And, uh, we are, we, are, we are happy that, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, so far, as far as we are concerned, these matters are going very well. And, uh, you know, we feel good that we are able to, to, to stand up and, uh, you know, challenge these matters in court. Okay. Uh, I, I must mention that um, in both these matters, uh, I'm, I'm representing the party in person um, because as a newly upcoming party, uh, you know, our resources are reserved for other mobilization activities. So we cannot afford to hire expensive lawyers. But again, we want to make a point that uh, justice should not be something that should be sold to the highest bidder. Uh, justice should not be a preserve of the rich uh, and powerful who can afford to hire, you know, a barrage of lawyers. Justice should be something that should be readily available to each and every citizen, regardless of the financial standing of that citizen regardless of whether that citizen is able to hire a lawyer or not. You understand? Justice should be ready and available to each and every citizen. So, again, that is the other point that we are trying to drive home. Right, and now, Mr. President, looking at uh, these issues that you have in court and also as a party, now uh, here we stand with uh, PEP, right? Uh, the E stands for economics, yes. right? Uh, and uh, our economy, I think uh, it's something that you can look at. And you, as an, uh, uh, a president, uh, may, maybe I may put uh, I, I may put it this way: once, uh, for example, the PF comes today. And uh, you being that person who knows a lot about, about economy and uh, given a chance to say, we want you to be the Minister of Finance, will you uh, throw it away or will you move with them at the same cadence? You know, the, the, the uh, normal uh, disposition on that uh, matter would be that one would want to serve their country even before uh, they, they have an opportunity to serve as president. But under the current dispensation, when you look at the current setup, you realize that um, ministers really don't have any power. They don't have any policy formulation power. They are merely lapdogs. You know, you are, you are just a figurehead. Uh, 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 and all decisions are basically made by a single individual who is the president and his close ideas uh, and communicated to you as a minister. So under the current dispensation, uh, it wouldn't make sense to serve as a minister in such a cabinet okay. uh, because, because you wouldn't have the chance to make an impact. You wouldn't have a chance to make a difference. And if you are not going to make a difference, then why even be there just to have the prestige of, you know, driving a vehicle which has a flag waving on, 
on your bonnet. I mean, that wouldn't be uh, uh, appropriate in my circumstances. But if uh, uh, it was a different government and possibly a different uh, president, maybe during Manawasa's time, and I was given uh, such a privilege, then I would be honored yeah. to serve. But not under the current dispensation because, you know, uh, the PF have uh, not only destroyed the country, but they've destroyed the manner in which government operates. Okay. You know, ministers are just ministers on paper. In reality, they are cracks. Uh, they have policy decisions which are communicated to them. They are told you've got a, a minister of finance who is told, oh, by the way, we are phasing off uh, value-added tax and we are replacing it with the GST, goods and service tax. And you are the minister of finance. You are informed the day before the the presentation of a budget and you incorporate it in your budget speech and you read it out so what purpose are you serving you understand so i wouldn't want to be that kind of a minister uh, uh i would i would definitely never uh, take up such an appointment all right uh, the uh, food, uh the food allowance uh, meal, uh, meal, meal allowance uh, for the students rather uh, being cut off uh, uh, the list uh, for the students I think this is affecting the, the citizens of Zambia and how do you look at such once elected in as the opposition alliance, uh, alliance I mean? You know, uh, Derek, when you look at the nature of life, uh, I mean, we are born and then we grow up and then we are adults. Uh, yes. We were children yesterday, I'm sure you remember. Yes. Uh, tomorrow will be old men, you understand. It's a cycle of life. And uh, the biggest investment that you can ever make, whether at a micro level, that is household level, or indeed at a national level, mm -hmm. is to invest in the children that are coming up. Yes. And the best way to invest in the children that are coming up is not necessarily to buy them expensive toys or anything at household level, no. It's to invest in their education. Mm -hmm. Make sure they are doing well in school, they are focused at school, and you raise them into responsible children that are educated at household level. At national level, you need to invest in the upcoming generation yes. so that uh, when you and me are old men now, you know, uh, sitting under a shed, you know, uh, enjoying a, a glass of whiskey with our hands shaking, <laughs> spilling half of the whiskey <laughs> in the process. Yes. We go to a hospital and we are being attended to. We need to be attended to by competent and diligent young men and women. Okay. And the only way that the doctors we are going to find in the hospital are going to be competent and diligent is if we invest in them right now. Yes. If we don't invest in them right now, when, when we are old and uh, we need medical attention, we go to that hospital, we'll be attended to by quacks. The same quacks that uh, were created due to our failure to invest in the generation coming behind us. Yes. So from my standpoint, that was... Uh, uh, a total lack of foresight on the part of the president to decide that uh, meal allowances need to be phased out. Because, you know, the reason that Mr. Rungu is president today is obviously because he's a lawyer and he can articulate issues. And the reason why he's a lawyer is because he got a degree from the University of Zambia. Yes. And the reason that he got a degree from the University of Zambia, despite coming from a very humble background in Chimwemwe, in Kitwe, is because the government of that time prioritized his education over other needs. You understand? So, so if he, the government of that time prioritized his education over the other needs that government had, and he ended up being educated, becoming a lawyer, and now becoming a Republican president, then why can't he do the same to the upcoming generation? Because obviously, if the government of that time did not invest, uh, prioritize education and did not invest in President Rungu's education, Right now, President Rungu would not have been president of this republic. Most likely, he would have been a Kaponya at KMB in Kitwe. You understand? Yeah. So that is the nature of life. We need to give back just, because other, uh, just, just the way others invested in us. We need to appreciate that. And the best way to appreciate that is to reciprocate the gesture in the upcoming generation. Okay. Yes. Right now, looking at uh, the education system where we see different things happening, especially decision making. Is it uh, for um, the minister herself just to come up with such, or maybe she needs also to ask from people and also seek advice from other people? In terms of... Um, uh, we, we the decision that is, she's making, like um, we recently we had uh, uh, the, the document that was circulating on social media over the, the witchcraft issue of, uh, you know, at uh, Unza. Uh, I think, uh, is it right for a minister to go that way or maybe it's uh, the policy making that is affecting the people? Well, uh, I, I never quite followed up uh, that issue of uh, the proposed introduction of uh, 
a witchcraft qualification by the Minister of Higher Education. Uh, but suffice to mention that um, whenever you're talking about policy, uh, government policy, you are talking about making decisions that are going to affect the masses. Yes. You understand? Yes. And uh, the thing about uh, government decisions, about government policy, is that uh, uh, those, those policy decisions have far-reaching consequences. Mm -hmm. They have a trickle-down effect. Mm -hmm. And in most instances, you cannot reverse the impact yes. once, once it, has, it, it, it has been... Uh, you know, exerted on the populace. So, so given, given that background, it is critical that before you take a policy decision on any matter, you need to ensure that such a policy is well researched. We have a caller. Hello. Good evening. Hello, good evening. Your name and where are you calling us from? I'm quiet. <laughs> Gonde Christopher from Muyombe. All right, uh, Mr. Gonde. Uh, go All right, uh, Mr. President, uh, people are speaking to you. Maybe you can respond to them. Oh, okay. No, not on for not on for Yama, but I'm wearing a more posaka man of Paco Vota. Not to more than the Rafi after my voter, I want to have a shakwatasana mano, number Mambo Kutula, then Mambo complain of food. So, Instayaku Vota, more posaka mano, Pantu, Nam Quata responsibility, Yaku Votera, and to our Longosoka. Maman. Eh, so, twenty twenty one, Muka Posaka mano, Pantu. Uh, up in the future, I have a new year pass take. Otherwise, in that time, whatever we know, Nishi again, he will choose you. Wala I have a pantanchi. My morning, I'm going to a total asana. Right, so this is someone who is calling us uh, from Yombe and is asking for the roads. Uh, and uh, this is a song that uh, almost every Zambian is singing exactly. And, and you know what, you know, you know what, um. Uh, it just occurred to me after traveling around uh, the country that uh, most of these so-called um, roads which the PF talk about are predominantly in Lusaka. When you just step out of Lusaka, there are no roads. Okay. Uh, when you step out of Lusaka, because I was going to Sesheke the other time, uh, I think last week, I was contemplating which route to use, whether to use the uh, southern province route via Livingstone, Kazungura there, or to use the, the Mongo route. And, and when you look at the, the road in both directions, you find that the road is deplorable. Uh, here, you know, the Kafue Mazabuka road, we thought that that company was putting up a new road, but they were merely patching portals. And those portals are already getting, uh, you know, getting dismantled because of the lens. So, so, so the PF, actually it's a myth that the PF have constructed roads. The PF have just constructed roads in a few neighborhoods in Lusaka. When you look at the key roads, in the outskirts of uh, uh, Lusaka, there are no roads to talk about. Okay. Yes. Right now, when we look at uh, roads, uh, that are a song that everyone sings about, uh, you know, the construction of roads. Uh, and now we come to the economy uh, of Zambia. And as we are not uh, moving away from our topic, which is uh, the ongoing uh, national dialogue, Mr. President, we need the dialogue as Zambia. But uh, now here comes uh, the fact that everyone should accept is. Uh, President Edgar Lungu and President Ada in the should sit down and make themselves clear to the people of Zambia that peace should be a fruit of everyone in Zambia too. You know, the issue of dialogue is not necessarily an issue of President Lungu and President Hichilema, no. Okay. Uh, President Hichilema is a mere stakeholder, just like myself. Okay. This is an issue that uh, if it is going to succeed, we will require the goodwill uh, of uh, President Lungu and his patriotic front, party and government. Okay. You understand? And that is what is it missing. Uh, because I'll tell you something, even after, let's say we have a successful dialogue and we have resolutions of a dialogue and we resolve that uh, the Public Order Act is going to be applied fairly and equitably uh, or, or it is going to be abolished altogether. 
uh, and that the Electoral Process Act of 2016 is going to be amended, and various other reforms, that there are going to be media reforms, so that we prevent the abuse of the media by the ruling party in two ways, by the way. Uh, on one hand, uh, they abuse the media through the practice of yellow journalism, yeah. where these state media institutions like Times of Zambia, uh, Zambia National Broadcasting Corporation, Zambia Daily Mail, basically practice yellow journalism, where every time they report about the opposition, they report them in bad light. Mm -hmm. They report bad things about them. They engage in a smear campaign against the opposition. Mm -hmm. And whenever they report about the ruling party, they are reporting about the ruling party in good light. So that is yellow journalism. And these institutions are funded by taxpayers' money, your money and my money, mm -hmm. and other poor people's money out there in the compound. So if these institutions are funded by taxpayers' money, then they have an obligation, a duty to report objective because they are national uh, institutions. Yeah. So that is one way the, the PF abuse the media. The other way is basically through the intimidation of privately owned media houses. So what the PF would do is that they will go to a uh, private media house and then they will try to dangle a carrot to them and yeah. say, okay, we are going to give you so much either as a once-off payment or as, as a recurring payment so that you can tune your reporting to favor us so that they can join the bandwagon of uh, yellow journalism that the public uh, media houses practice. And if uh, uh, a private media doesn't have a backbone, they'll fall in line. That is why you find there are a lot of uh, private media institutions that are always parroting on behalf of the patriotic front. Those are on the payroll, a monthly payroll in most instances, of the patriotic front. That is why you find that one week they are reporting for the PF and then a month later they are reporting against the PF. It means that uh, the PF haven't remitted the monthly payment. So they want to remind them that you haven't paid us yet. <laughs> Can you pay us? You understand? Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so that is, uh, and, and for those media houses that have a backbone, those who resist the uh, PF bribes, what normally happens is that uh, the PF will then proceed to go and intimidate them. They will either send the police there with a search warrant and say, no, we are looking for, for this footage or whatever, or they will basically ask the not so independent, independent broadcasting authority to basically uh, issue letters to them and say, hey, you're reporting what, what, you understand. So that is abuse of the media. And all that is done to try and prop up their dwindling political fortunes, you know, the PF's dwindling political fortunes. Without all those tactics, without all those tools, the PF is pretty much non-existent in this country because people have clearly seen that any government whose president prioritizes the purchase of an additional private jet for himself and his luxury, any president that prioritizes the sending of his wife on a shopping spree under the disguise of receiving fire tenders, and yet on the other hand, the peasant farmers have not been paid for the meals they supply to government, the students have not, uh, are being declined their meal allowances, uh, pensioners uh, have not been paid despite the fact that they faithfully and diligently served this republic. You know, the reason, and, and you know, I, I always get very uh, uh, personal when we talk about pensioners, because these are individuals who are not asking for a favor from government. They are not asking for a handout. No, this is money which was deducted from them when they were still youthful and productive. Money was deducted from their pay slip. If that money was not deducted from their pay slip, these people would have been saving that money in their own savings account. Yeah. But government was deducting that money from them saying that we are keeping this money for you. When you retire and you're old, we'll give you this money uh, after uh, it has uh, achieved the returns. It would have increased in size. Now, these people are now old. They retire. And uh, most of them have got all sorts of chronic uh, diseases. Mm -hmm. Others have got hypertension. Others have got BP. Others have got cancer. Others have got HIV AIDS. And these people are not productive. One, because of their age and two, because of their various chronic diseases. And what they are saying is that, okay, fine, you were deducting money from our pay slip every month for the past 30 years. Can we please have that money yeah. so that we can be able to help ourselves mm -hmm. and be able to help our children and be able to feed ourselves? Mm -hmm. And government says, no, we don't have money. <sighs> but how can you not have money? You are deducting money from us. What did you do with that money? And in the midst of government, of the PF government saying they don't have money, the president proceeds and spends 700 million uh, kwacha on a private jet that has a bar inside. You understand? How reasonable is that? Did you that, see the pictures, Mr. President? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, we saw the pictures of the Gulf Stream. And you know what? 
those people who try to advance the argument that no, the president's uh, previous private jet was getting old and it needed to be replaced and blah, blah, blah. You know, aeroplanes come in different categories and different makes. You understand? Yeah. The Gulfstream uh, uh, family of planes is the Rolls Royce uh, among planes. You know, the way the Rolls Royce is among cars. Yeah. You understand? And what we are saying is that the president could have bought a perfectly durable, dependable aircraft, such as an ATR-45 that the president of Botswana has, which the president of Malawi has. You understand? Yeah, a brand new one for just uh, less than 10% of that 58.8 million which he spent. And it would have been, it would have served the purpose perfectly. But he decides to go and buy a private jet, a Gulfstream G650 private jet, which uh, only rich people like uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, like Floyd Mayweather, you know, the boxer. Yeah. Those are the private jets that those people uh, fly around with the nicely decorated uh, inside bars. So why would a president of a poor country uh, uh, no uh, spend so much money. There's no library on the plane but a bus. Well, I, I'm not sure about the library. <laughs> I'm talking about what I'm sure about. Okay. So why would the president of a poor country want to spend so much money on uh, a very expensive private jet? Even if you wanted a private jet, why not get an affordable private jet? So it shows you the levels of uh, lecklessness. It shows you the levels of gluttony that we have in the leadership of the current government. And uh, with such a glutonious uh, 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 government, with such glutonious individuals who only care about their stomachs and their pockets, there is no way that this country can develop. And that is why the citizens of this republic need to stand up and basically ensure, okay, it is our collective responsibility as citizens of this republic to ensure that we don't allow this country to deteriorate further than it has already deteriorated. Okay. Yeah, as it is right now, if it is put in the right hands, it can be salvaged. But if we don't take action now, it will reach a point whereby it is beyond any kind of salvage. Right. Uh, and uh, Enoch Roosevelt Tonga, ERT writes, uh, President of uh, State Liberation Movement, says, uh, President, um, uh, Mr. President, I'm following the program and this is very great. I like the way you're coming out, right? And uh, and also he quotes uh, uh, Madame Dora Celia, a spokesperson for the government, as uh, I was saying, um, Dora Celia has been be bemoaned over the st uh, the state that the police is being brutal on some instances when it comes to dealing with violence related issues. She wondered why police, serves, police service is conducting itself as a force, not a service. In a statement, she observed that uh, being aware of death being recorded in uh, some, part, uh, some parts of uh, the country and also is uh, the unprofessionalism of uh, the conduct of the police and men and women in uh, the uniform. She says a uh, government is very concerned, is very concerned who is uh, promoting and uh, uh, supporting the panga fighting PF when Edgar Lungu has publicly condemned society of violence and also as ERT says we believe that all crocodile tears and Celia the group must must have felt some way and seen how violence is slowly uh, being turned in Zambia in their <coughs> own hands. Right, uh, this is uh, the way that, that uh, Mr. President, you just from saying, and uh, President uh, Eno Roosevelt Tonga of uh, the Third Liberation Movement uh, is saying to say, first of all, he's appreciating you for coming out uh, in this manner. Thank you. And also, he's saying, um, he's, try, he's quoting uh, Madame Dora Celia, the minister, and also chief uh, spokesperson of the government, saying uh, it's uh, the tears that she's showing uh, are the cocoa, cocoa, uh, crocodile uh, tears. Now, Mr. President, to go back to our issue of uh, the ongoing national dialogue, um, do you think this dialogue will succeed? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. Well, this dialogue needs to succeed. Okay. Yes, it needs to succeed. Because if it doesn't succeed, what that will mean is that um, we are going to get into the 2021 general election okay. with the, the same political tension that existed in 2016. Okay. Uh, although this time it will be uh, more pronounced yes. because obviously the level of frustration among the population will be greater yes. than it was in 2016. Yes. I'll tell you something. You know, if, if you get into an election and the playing field is level, 
you were allowed to campaign and then you lose an election. That's fine. I mean, you lost. The, the people, uh, not enough people voted for you. Yes. You understand that? There's no problem. But the problem comes in if you get into an election and prior to the election, you are being prevented from campaigning by the police under the instruction of the ruling PF party. They prevent you from campaigning. And it's only them who are campaigning. And then you get into an election. And then uh, there are a lot of other irregularities in that election. Yes. And then after that election, you are told you've lost the election. Yes. That is totally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. It's like he, they are treating you like you are small children, okay. uh, whereby they can just apply cotton wool on your, on your, on your eyes. And, and that's it. You understand? So that situation might have worked in 2016. But come 2021, it is untenable. It cannot work again. Okay. That formula cannot work again. Yeah. So, so what we're saying is that this dialogue process has to succeed. And we need to undertake the necessary reforms in terms of the application of the Public Order Act. We need to undertake uh, the necessary reforms in terms of the uh, Electoral Process Act, which for all intents and purposes legalizes uh, electoral malpractice because it puts the standard of proof required in a court of law for you to overturn an election result uh, 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 through a petition uh, at a ridiculously high level, uh, you know, such that no one can possibly prove. <laughs> you get the point. Yeah. And, and if you set the, the bar to an unreasonably high level that no one can prove an electoral malpractice, what you have effectively done is that you have legalized electoral malpractice, okay. which means whoever wants to engage in electoral malpractice will be free uh, uh, to go and engage in electoral malpractice. Okay. So we are saying such a situation is not tenable because people see these things. So if we get into 2021 with the same charged environment that we have now, with the same kind of violence that exists in, uh, that existed in Sesheke in the last by-election, then it will be a very dangerous uh, situation for the security and stability of this country. So it is in our best interest to make sure dialogue succeeds. As to whether it will actually succeed, that, 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 that remains uh, uh, debatable because uh, it, it depends to a large extent on the political will of the Republican president. Because you must remember that uh, this dialogue process is supposed to lead, uh, or rather is supposed to lead to uh, uh, legal reforms. Yeah. And, and when those legal reforms are undertaken, of course we have established institutions of governance in this country, parliament being one of them. So when, when the dialogue process resolutions are made, they will have to feed into legal reforms. And then when those bills are drafted and taken to parliament, we will need the goodwill of the parliamentarians, uh, including ruling party parliamentarians, to pass those uh, bills and enact them into law. And even after that law has been enacted, we are going to need the goodwill of uh, uh, President Lungu to assent that uh, 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 law into effect. Yes. Uh, without his assent, despite the fact that the dialogue process might have been successful, despite the fact that uh, parliament might have passed those uh, bills, if the president doesn't assent, then they will not come into law. So, so there are a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, bridges that need to be crossed. And, and most of those bridges require the full participation of uh, President Rungu uh, uh, for, for this to, to succeed. And so far, we can see that President Rungu is dragging his feet. So, uh, you know, the question remains whether the president will have a change of mind at some point, and, and, you know, realize that the, the future security of our republic depends on his actions now, not in 2021, that would be too late. It depends on his actions now. Uh, the, the, the hope is that uh, the president will realize that and uh, he will fully get on the dialogue table uh, and basically lead the necessary legal reforms and assent to those bills into law. So that as we get to 2021, we'll have a level playing field, whoever wants to campaign, will be able to campaign freely, just the way the PF themselves campaigned before they came to power. And it was under the same Public Order Act. The Public Order Act hasn't changed. Yeah. Uh, and yet, uh, the PF are abusing the same Public Order Act yeah. to prevent us in the opposition now from being able to campaign. So that is totally unacceptable. But uh, if the PF insists that um, we need to get into 2021 with the existing uh, uh, political tension, and uh, they insist that uh, they want the 2021 general elections to be chaotic, then we have no option but to participate under those chaotic uh, uh, circumstances okay. and, 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 and see what happens. But whatever the case, we are confident that 
the opposition is going to win the 2021 general elections with a landslide. All right, well, that's very good. Uh, well articulated, Mr. President. Thank you, Congress. really appreciate uh, for uh, coming and also making your appearance on the big picture. And Thank hopefully you. this will not be the first and last for you to appear on live television. Uh, not at all, Comrade. All right, uh, so now, uh, uh, as, we, uh, as we are closing, uh, the last uh, issue that you have to address to the people of Zambia is over. Uh, the youths that have lost of, in terms of uh, the, their empowerment. Maybe uh, you can look into the camera and address the, the people of Zambia. Thank you, Government. I think to the people of this republic, um, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words. Um, you know, we, we, when you look at our quality of life, uh, our quality of life is very, very low. And uh, we do not deserve to have this low quality of life. Uh, when you look at developed countries, what is needed for a country to develop or for individuals to develop in a country is basically two things. On one hand, you need the full participation of the citizens, their hard work and their commitment to better their lives. And then on the other hand, you need the government to create the necessary conducive atmosphere so that the citizens can be able to thrive. What we have at the moment in this country are hardworking citizens without the necessary conducive environment uh, being created by the government. Because uh, when you look at instances like the current domestic debt, which stands at, or rather the domestic arrears, because domestic debt is basically uh, the, the, the treasury bills and government bonds which are issued by Bank of Zambia. But when you look at the current domestic arrears, which is basically money which government owes to various suppliers of goods and services, you realize that it is standing at about 15 billion kwacha. And this is uh, something that has been outstanding for the past four to five years. So what that means is that small-scale businessmen who supply goods to government have not been paid for a very long time, and their money is basically tied up. So the citizens have done their part. They wake up early in the morning uh, to go to work. They try to employ fellow citizens, and they supply goods and services to government. And the government is not doing its part to make sure that those goods and services are paid for so that the citizens can continue to thrive in their small businesses and they can continue to create employment in their small businesses. So what we are saying is that in the government that will come after 2021, the government will be able to do its part. It will be able to ensure that every person who, supply, who supplies goods and services to the government is paid on time so that that citizen can go back and uh, continue thriving in their small business, as opposed to being undermined. When you look at peasant farmers, they have only one income, the crops that they produce the whole year and supply to government through food reserve agency. So when people make an effort, they work hard, they produce, and they supply to government. And government fails to do its part by being able to pay those people. They are not asking for a favor. They are not asking for a handout. They are merely asking to be paid for the hard work that they put in to produce the crops that they produce. And government is dilly-dallying. As we are speaking right now, government owes peasant farmers more than 240 million kosher from the last farming season. That situation is totally unacceptable. So in the government that will come in 2021, we are going to ensure that the government does its job and facilitates the prosperity of the citizens of this republic. The only citizens that uh, will not be prosperous after 2021 are lazy citizens. And for lazy citizens, really, there's nothing much you can do about them. But for any hardworking Zambian, they can be assured that they are going to be prosperous, they are going to be rich after 2021. All right, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Thank President. you, thank you, Coming for making it. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, right, thank uh, you. tonight uh, on the big picture, as we are coming to the end of the show, this has been uh, your host, uh, Derek Daka, on uh, live television. We really appreciate uh, to everyone that uh, made uh, sure that we come live on uh, this uh, platform. And also, thank you very much uh, to uh, our sponsors. And uh, this is Vintage uh, Services uh, Limited uh, Zambia. All right, we say. Thank you very much uh, to the technician of tonight, uh, Andrew Chiwele, and uh, known by the name of uh, DJ Racy and the entire crew of Life TV. Not forgetting Matteo Chilenga for the studio for the studio setup, uh, right? Uh, and also, thank you very much to the entire management of Life TV. This has been the big picture. Enjoy the rest of our programming, and uh, we say good night. <laughs> Oh,
I've been trying to reach you, but you call it Benetton.